scriptures over the next three weeks. Today we're going to talk about every believer's battle. Next week we're going to talk about a subject that's not every believer's battle, but there are many believers that deal with demonic warfare. All right? That's next week. And then the, the last week, the, this is a three-part series, we're going to deal with those that deal with discouragement, depression, and deliverance. And we're going to look at these subjects over the next three weeks in this totalness of spiritual warfare. But let me tell you, I love what God's doing. If people won't come to church, he'll put the subject matter in, in the movie theaters now so that you can go see them. And there's no excuse. One of the things that, that irks me so much is I, I know that there's help that God is sending all the time. And so many people continue to fight the same battles over and over. I got kids, you've got kids, you've got relatives and all the rest of you are going, go see War Room. You're fighting the wrong battle. You're fighting the wrong people. You're fighting your girlfriend. You're fighting your spouse. You're fighting your family. You're fighting the wrong person. Are you catching this? All right. So spiritual warfare today, we're gonna, I'm going to take you from the very beginning, how God lined this out, and that this battle today is every believer's battle. Let's pray. Father, as we open up your word, I believe that this word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, you also placed within that verse that your word will separate our spirit and our soul. Lord, there's a reason why you would include that. Help us today to understand the battle that every believer goes through and I pray today that we would start understanding how to have victory within our lives. And we give you the praise for it right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're going to lay precept upon precept. So we're going to start in Genesis. When God created Adam, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And I'm going to take you through a bunch of scriptures today. But I'm going to show you the process of how every believer can figure out how to win the personal battle, all right? And one of the reasons that I feel as God's brought Mindy and I back to the Church of Nazarene is because the Church of Nazarene believes in a two works of grace, salvation and sanctification. Sanctification is where every believer wins the battle. And you're going to see that. I'm going to explain it in terms so that you go, sanctification, that's, that's a, a college-level term. I don't know what that means. I'm going to explain that process to you today as clear as I've ever learned how to share it. As a matter of fact, as, as I was watching War Room and God was laying this series on my heart, uh, our, our kids even sent us a, a video of another man that, that actually preached a message titled Every, Every Believer's Battle, and I thought, wow, this is, this is God really just directing this stuff here. This is for the ark. This is so that you can be victorious, all right? In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God is in the sixth day. He's already created the heavens and the earth. He's hung the moon and the stars and the sun, and he's now making man in verse 7. Listen to what it says right here. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now, it says God took his breath and he breathed it into Adam's nostrils, and it was the breath of life. That in the Hebrew was God's spirit. He breathed his spirit into man's spirit. Now, we're not going to go through the whole fall of man here, but you know Adam and Eve made a wrong choice about obeying God. And God said, when you eat of this certain tree, you will die. They did die instantly the day they ate of that tree. They died physically years later, but they died spiritually that day. You see, when God breathed into Adam's nostrils, he breathed his spirit inside him. You are made up of God's spirit. And when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, God's spirit left man. That's why you find them hiding in the garden. 
That's why they're clothing themselves with fig leaves. That's why they're afraid now, instead of rejoicing when God came to the garden, they're fearful and they're hiding behind the bushes because they have died spiritually. And since that time, every human being is born dead spiritually. Every human being is born dead spiritually. Now, let me take you through the process. When you get saved, guess what's happening? You come to life. You're born again. What? Spiritually. Christ in you. Just like he did in the garden where he breathed into Adam's life, when you receive Jesus Christ, his spirit comes inside you and you're alive. You're a new person. You're not the old person you were before. Christ is living in you. But there is a battle, and it's every believer's battle. Now, God has a plan for you to win this battle. And I'm going to show you how this battle lays out. We're going to go through a couple scriptures here, and then we're going to walk through the process. All right. In Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, this is the scripture that you hear me pray a lot. As a matter of fact, I prayed it here this morning as we, as we started this, this time together here. Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. All right? Here's where every believer's battle comes in. There's a struggle. If you notice, God has prepared for the struggle to be won. He divides the soul and the spirit. When you're born, you're born with your soul. When you're saved, God puts his spirit in you. Before then, you were the walking dead. Not like you see on the television. You're not a zombie. You're not going to eat people's faces off. Though you might have had some relatives that you felt like they tried to eat your face off or other things like that. You know, sometimes we really do treat each other pretty poorly in this realm. But in this part of it, you're seeing that you're more than just a physical being. You have a soul and a spirit, and that's where every believer's battle is. Now, Paul speaks of this one other place here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he's going to tell you the difference between a spiritual Christian and a Christian that hasn't learned to grow in his spirit yet, who is still being ruled by their soul, by their flesh, by their humanness, all right? Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. Okay, ooh, if you notice, the Spirit is in them. They're mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? All right. This is the battle right here. Worldly Christians. You've been a worldly Christian. I've been a worldly Christian. What's a worldly Christian? This is is what you need to know. It's very important here. A worldly Christian, they have the spirit of Christ in them, but their soul is in control. It's the carnal or the selfish or the human side is in control, not the spirit of God. All right? That's a worldly Christian. They have Christ in them. But guess what? The old person, and what is the the soul? Let's let's look at that so you can see this. The soul is made up of three parts. The soul is made up of three parts. It's made up of your mind, your emotions, and your will. That's your soul. So if you didn't get saved to your 25, 35, 40, 50, 60, 70 years of age, you've been living most of your life by 
being soul driven, your mind, your emotions, your will has been setting your direction. When you ask Jesus inside, his spirit comes in, but just like what Paul just said here, you're still an infant and you still act worldly because why? You were trained by your own mind, by your own emotions, and by your own will how you wanted to live. So there's a battle within. Christ is now in you, but the old you, your soul, fights the spirit of Christ. It'd be really neat is once Christ comes in that it's all of a sudden it's like, okay, Jesus, you're in charge, take over everything. That's the way it's supposed to work, but that's a surrendering process. We call it, that's a sanctifying process. But what takes place most of the time is Jesus comes in, he says, I'm boss. And your soul rises up and says, we'll see about that. You can be boss on Sunday. But when I'm with my friends, when my mind recalls the things that I want to do, I may take control. When my emotion says, remember, when you do this, that feels good, I may take control. And ultimately, my will is in control. So here's the battle every believer goes in. It's the spirit versus the soul. The spirit of Christ is in, but you're an infant. How do you feed and grow spiritually to become spiritual men and women? Men and women that can do battle and can win, and that the soul then becomes spirit-filled. That's the process of the battle that we're in here this morning. Now, I love what Paul said here in Corinthians. He said, I could feed you milk, but not really deep stuff because your mind's not there. Your emotions aren't there. Your will's not there. You just want Jesus to save you from hell. That's all you wanted. But there's so much more. There's so much more. In Psalms 131, verse 2, this is a great psalm. In the ESV, listen to what it says here. But I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. Isn't it interesting that David writes this, and, and Psalms 131 is only three verses long, the whole, the whole chapter. In verse 2, he's given us an insight about who we are as human beings, our soul. We have to wean it from the things of this world. How interesting that that's why Paul would say, you're still on milk. You haven't been weaned yet. You're a worldly Christian. You haven't learned to wean your mind. You haven't learned to wean your emotions. You haven't learned to wean your will from the things of this world. You still let those things draw you, and you want to be nurtured by those things instead of by the Spirit of God. Is it making sense? Am I connecting? Are we, you're, you're really quiet. Okay, I can get a few nods here. All right. Are you ca- catching this? This is how this battle goes on, and, and let me show you this. So what, what he's talking about, there's a retraining of your soul. Watch the process in, in this retraining. The mind is your recall center. Let's talk about that for a moment. Your mind is an amazing creation of God. You store every bit of information that's ever happened in you, the good, the bad, the ugly, all the rest. Uh, I, when, when I was listening to Robert Morris preach on this, he said, he said, some years you meet somebody and you go, I don't like them. You go, well, you don't even know them. Well, it's because your mind recalled 40 other people just like them. And you go, they remind me of, in my mind, I got all this, and I don't know why, but I don't like them. You haven't given them a chance, but you see, it's because your mind is taken over right there. We're supposed to greet one another as if we're greeting them in the Lord, in the Spirit of God, seeing them in the newness of Christ. But we have a battle. Our mind says, "Uh uh-uh, no, that reminds me of so-and-so, and and -and so-and-so didn't treat me good. I don't like so-and-so, so so therefore I automatically don't like this person. Isn't it amazing? So the mind needs to be retrained. Now, my life verse is Romans 12, too. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be 
transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is the sanctifying power of God's Spirit. Christ in you, you now surrender your mind to let the Spirit teach the mind how to think. You've taught it how to think through your life experiences. And as a matter of fact, what teaches your mind a lot is your emotions. The emotions is the second part. The emotion is the control center. Let's be honest, we learned very quick. Uh, we didn't like being wet when we were kids, so we cry, and mom and dad hopefully changed our diapers. We learned, hmm, crying, emotion, got us the comfort we wanted. So we've trained our mind through our emotion center, it's the control center, that if it feels good, do it. And all of a sudden, we got a enlightened society that says, that's the way life works. If it feels good, if it feels right, if it feels like love, it must be love. And you've based everything on an emotional center, and the emotions are many times worldly and even sinful emotions. You can train your body to like things that will kill you. My dad was an alcoholic. You've known that. I have alcoholism on both sides of the family. Mindy has it on their side of the family. Let me tell you how it works. The alcohol makes your emotions go, oh, I feel good. I feel relaxed. What used to take two beers or so to make you feel like you're mellow, now because alcohol ha doesn't give you the same thing, it likes to take over. You see, alcohol isn't something that's content in just keeping you at the two. Now all of a sudden it takes 12 to get you to feel what you felt when you felt in the very beginning for two. And what happens then, now alcohol has you. Because you, you, you start drinking from the moment, some of you, the moment you get up. My brother Sean will tell you, he used to put the vodka in his water bottle because it's clear. That's how for the longest time, now again, because the, the longer you drink, the more it takes for you to actually look like you're drunk. So he could go to work all day long drinking and sipping on vodka and nobody would know. This happens to many relatives. It's in all our homes and all the rest. And so all of a sudden our emotions say, I need this. Your mind clicks in, it makes me feel right. And what has happened? We've allowed something to become an addiction in our life. But you know what, alcohol doesn't play fair. It hits in, in the last stage, the death stage, it's called reverse tolerance. And what happens here, emotionally, you now feel like you have to have it. You can, it, it because you start withdrawing, you get the DDTs, you get, you get the shakes, you get, you know, you get, you, you're a mess, right? I know, I, I messed up on that one. So, uh, you, you know what I was talking about. You get, you start, you start, when you're detoxing, it starts, your body goes into this withdrawal and it makes you sick, literally. So your emotions and your mind are going, well, we need that to feel now well. It's reverse tolerance that's taking place. And somewhere along that line, there's a switch that's thrown. And now one beer or one drink can send you into a blackout, send you into a realm that reverse tolerance. Your liver can no longer handle all that you've been drinking. I have family members, Mindy has family members that deal with this all the time. My dad, even though he was sober for 16 years of his life, could not have anything that had vanilla extract in it or NyQuil in it because of the alcohol level in it. It could make him black out because the alcohol took over the body what happened they didn't try a spirit of christ that would be greater than he that's in you than he that's in the world and they kept relying on what their mind said recall you drink this you feel good your emotion says we're in control here it, when you get it you go Oh, thank you. I, I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be again. Now, I'm just picking on alcohol here because it's, it's the, the accepted one in society today. 
And it's the one that's hit my household a lot. Many of my nieces and nephews are down this path. Many of my, my in-laws are down this path. Many of my own children have gone down this path. And you know what you were, did? You gave up the battle early. You said the soul will control your body. And yet you're supposed to be a spirit man, a spirit woman. But you gave the battle over to the soul early, and your mind and emotions came in here. So you know what happened? Your will. Your will, and, and let me tell you, until you're sanctified, until you surrender fully to the Holy Spirit, your will is a selfish decision center. It's never going to make a decision outside of what's best for you. And it only knows what's best for you from the sickness of what your mind and emotions have been telling it. So your will is now a self-centered decision-making part of it that says, I choose for me. I have to take care of me. And you don't trust anybody. Wow. Am I spelling out the difference between being saved and unsaved? Let me tell you, many Christians receive Christ. And they still deal with this. They still deal with alcoholism. They still deal with pornography. They still, pornography works in the same way. It does the same thing. It captures, it takes more and more and more where you degress, 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 that you go from watching porn and what you go is normal sex to where you're watching everything that is so disgusting that you'd be ashamed that anybody would catch you in it. And yet, that's what you need because your, your emotions need more all the time in that. And it's controlling the whole part of it, and you're captive. But I want you to know, Jesus came to set the captive free. When the Spirit of Christ came in you, it didn't come in just to partner with all this bad stuff. He came to fill you with His Spirit, to sanctify you wholly. Now watch this right here. The word and worshiping God are retraining tools along with the power of the Holy Spirit. Worshiping the word won't get you there by itself. If you don't have the power source of the Holy Spirit, you don't get there. It's the work of the Spirit to have you do what Christ intended you to live as. A spirit man. A Spirit. That's why I love what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. He says, aren't you acting just like mere humans? But you're not just a human. You're a spiritual being. Amen? I hate when I act like a mere human. My wife hates when I act like a mere human. Everybody hates when I act like a mere human. I don't even like me when I act like a mere human. Are you catching it? We were meant to have this union and this fellowship. From the very beginning, creation, God breathed his breath, his spirit into Adam. And sin removed that for all mankind. So Jesus comes to die so that you and I could have his spirit once again in us. But we have to surrender all that mind, emotion, and will to the retraining program. That's what being spirit-filled is. Christ in you now saying, God, I'm allowing Jesus to retrain my mind, to transform it, to retrain my emotions. I won't trust them until I sense they're God emotions. I won't trust my will until I sense I'm walking in God's word and in his spirit because my will is selfish, self-centered, me-centered. All right. Romans. Here's where it's all spelled out. Paul, who started with the Corinth, Church of Corinth, and the Church of Rome, he spells out this whole battle. And he gives you the battle blow by blow in Romans chapter 8, starting with the, the fifth verse. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Listen to what he goes on to say here. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the flesh desires pretty obvious the soul is in control here but those who live according with the spirit have their minds set on the spirit's desires the mind governed by the flesh is death he doesn't pull any punches in this battle does he 
This is spiritual warfare. You either get to go on to life or you deal with death. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Wow. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. Yeah, because it's self-centered. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. You go, but I'm a Christian. You go, yeah, but you got this whole other part of you, your soul. It's been trained. As a matter of fact, let me give you, let me take just a little detour right here. Way back in history, there was a foretelling that the, the older will serve the younger. And Paul actually, in Romans 9, 23, just another chapter over, says, this is a spiritual analogy. Oh, I'm always going to be older in my flesh unless I got saved at the moment I was born, which is impossible. Okay? So this is the spiritual analogy, and it's talking about there where Ishmael had to serve Isaac, Okay, and it goes on through that, that, that Esau had to serve Jacob. The older served the younger. We are supposed to always let Christ in us, the newness in us, serve that which is older, our flesh. That the flesh is never supposed to be the one in charge, calling the shots. The younger, the newness of Christ is what's calling it right here. And, and listen to what he goes on to say. This is so powerful. Verse, verse 8. Those who are in are in the realm of the flesh, cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you're in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Wow. All right. Let me tell you, I I know that's what it's basically saying is there's a battle every believer has. It's between the spirit of Christ that's in you and your old way, your humanness, your mind, your emotions and your will, your soul has been trained in your own selfish things, in the things of the world in this. And he's saying right here, but you have a force inside you that's greater than anything here if you surrender it to be filled. You win. It's a surrendering process. Now, you wake up each day, you have a choice. When you're you're just at the salvation part, if you haven't gone on to being spirit-filled, being sanctified, you wake up each day, and here's what you have to do each day. You've got to learn to recognize God's voice in your life, and I want you to know it sounds like God's word. But you know very well the voice of your mind and your will and your emotions. And it's a friendly voice. It woos you. It says, do you remember? And of course, your mind does remember. Your emotions does go, oh, that, that yeah, that, it, how could it be so wrong if it feels so good? Isn't that what the world says? Isn't that what we've said to ourselves? So we selfishly choose what we know is wrong. So what do we do at that point? We shut off the voice of God speaking to our heart. Being spirit-filled is always saying, Christ, I hear you. Here am I, Lord, yes. I'll do this. I'll go your way. Now watch what he, what he does here in these last five verses, 11 through 16. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, whoa, pretty powerful stuff, living in where? In you, Ah, living where? In you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, it's talking to all what went on there, brothers and sisters, we have no obligation. But it's not we, oh, I'm sorry, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put 
to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit who received does not make us slaves so that you will live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Let me tell you what's taking place. This is, this is theology 101. God's grace. It's a gift. His salvation's a gift, and being spirit-filled is the same gift. Let's look at the work of grace. The first is a finished work. The finished work of grace in your spirit. When Christ comes in, all the power to live victorious is already there. It's a finished work. It's done. Christ in you. You got hope now. But there's still another work. This is a progressive work of grace in your soul. Your soul is your mind, your emotions, and your will. A progressive work is now going to take place for the rest of your life. And every believer's battle is in their soul. How interesting. How, I, I know next week we're going to deal with the demonic warfare, but that's not every believer's battle. This is every believer's battle right here. Every one of us battle between the spirit of Christ in us and whether or not we'll respond to the old way of life and let it rule. We have that choice. You know how often? Daily. Sometimes many times in a day. Isn't that amazing? So, Jesus gives us this, this word. These are his words in Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. This is what he says. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves. <gasps> Why not cross out themselves and put, deny your soul. Des deny your, your mind. Deny your, your emotions. Deny your self-centered choices. Deny themselves and take up their cross daily mm. and follow me. Now watch how he adds on to this. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever wants to hold on to a little piece of their, their old way of thinking over here, their old emotions, their old, I still get to choose this. I give all that to God, but God doesn't really care about this. So they're not fully surrendered, are they? They're not fully spirit-filled or spirit-led. So whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. Pretty powerful. For me, after all these years of being a Christian, I still have to evaluate how much my soul is still alive. I got to kill that sucker off every day day. I die daily to self. Anytime I start thinking, well, I died pretty good yesterday, so I can just be, guess what? The, all the tapes in my mind, all the emotions are all still there. I have to continue to invite Christ to sanctify it, to purify. Now, I'm amazed my emotions today are so totally different than what they were 25, 30 years ago. They're so different than what they were even 10 years ago. It takes a process, and, and I've learned this. I don't trust that thing called emotions. So sometimes my emotions are really, you know, you, you know if, if I didn't know better, you, you'd think maybe bipolar really up, and then sometimes I'm very, very, very that and that, and I go, I don't trust either side of that emotion part of it. Now, I've started to learn about genuine joy. Sounds like an emotion, doesn't it? Jesus promised that if you surrender to his spirit, you will have life and peace. Peace brings joy. When you've got peace, 
there's joy. There's something to be happy about. Now, I'm going to give you some practical things, and these are the practical things that I'm doing right now. Uh, many of these are my Facebook friends. Did you notice that a few days ago I put on there, taking a vacation from the Facebook world to visit my spiritual world a little better? How many saw that? Okay, quite a few of you. And that, that's because I was working on this message. And I was just like, wow, this Facebook world brings me into the drama world of everybody else. And, you know, I got family members, church members, and all the rest. And if they put something on there, if I'm on there, they expect a response. And I was feeling like I'm drawn into a world where it's all everything that's very little of it is God. So I took a little sabbatical. I don't know how long it'll take the sabbatical, but I want to tell you. It was almost like feeling like I gave up an addiction. After two days, I said, Mindy, I'm two days clean. I haven't had to go to Facebook. And she said, well, it's your birthday. You should check on it. I said, no, I put the note on there. She goes, oh, Kevin. All, I, and all of a sudden, so I take a little look. No one said happy birthday. I got off it real quick. I went, wow, you know, hey, that's all right. Those that, that know you, they text you or they call you or whatever, right? And, 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 but all of a sudden... I was able to replace, we heard a minister say this, what if you replaced all the time you did on Facebook with a spiritual time? Okay, here's your practical help here in this. Worship in the Word must be a part of everyday experience to grow strong in God's Spirit. I believe I'm talking to Christians here. God's Spirit's inside you. To grow strong in it, you have to worship and be in the Word every day. You have to soak in it. You have to enjoy it. You have to find those, those parts and those, those times where, where you listen to it. And, and I, I love, one of the things that I like to do is I, I, I like to blare worship music and stuff. And, and my little computer, you can't blare anything. It just doesn't have the speaker. So, so Mindy bought me a Bose computer uh, that, that's Wi-Fi that I can put anywhere. Any, what is it? Speaker. speaker. What did I say? Computer. Okay, she bought me the speaker for my computer. Thank you. Keep me straight here. The Bose speaker for my computer so I can blare my worship music and I can just, me and God, get my mind and my emotions. Worship does something in the emotional realm. It retrains it. Retrains it to be tender and soft to the things of God. The Word does what? It judges my thoughts and my attitude. It divides the soul and the spirit. It lets me see what is coming from God and what's coming from me. That's what Hebrews 4.12 tells us in this. So, watch this. You have to remove an old pattern. Give up something. I'm not asking you to give up Facebook. That was mine. You got to, don't, you know, maybe God will tell you the same thing because let me tell you, there's quite a few people addicted to Facebook. It's all right. But, but let it be a God thing. Let him tell you it. You go, you know, if, if you go five hours without Facebook and you, you're feeling a little, oh, I wonder what everybody's saying, then yeah, it's probably something you should give up, <laughs> okay? Uh, but look for something to give up. That's learning to deny the flesh. You're practicing a very strong principle. I'm giving up something, not just to give up something so I can take up. This is the next part. You've not remove something just to remove so I can create a new pattern now watch these new patterns in here I'm going to add some personal God time or I may add some family God time or some marriage God time are you, if you notice personal family marriage God time I'm giving up something of the flesh so that I can be more of a spiritual man or woman in my spirit because God has called me to be a warrior. He's given a scripture and he said, forceful men will lay hold of my kingdom, not wimps that let their emotions and their mind and their will lead them all around, but the forceful men of God will lay hold of the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, there's warfare that's been happening, and we've been losing. We've been losing. 
And we have the greatest power, the creator of the universe living inside us. And Christians are losing. Not anymore. Not anymore. Not from this day forward. All God's people said? Amen. Amen. Not anymore. You can't justify anymore that something's got greater hold of you than Jesus does. It's something that you're, you have to now say, well, sorry, Jesus, I do want this more than I want you. You've got to be up front with him on that. You've got to be honest with him about that. He already knows it. It's you're making yourself aware. I go for this more than I go to, to Jesus. I let this give me my calmness. I let this give me my peace, not Jesus. And watch how good this does for you, how often it puts you in trouble, how often it comes for its paycheck, and it wants payment for that. When Christ gives freely, wow, the devil really knows how to dupe us, doesn't it? But the greatest battle for every believer is right in here. We've been divided, spirit and soul. But he said, to his disciples. I'm going to the Father, and I'm sending one, the Comforter. (gasps) You don't need Southern Comfort. you got Heavenly Comfort coming. Come on, let's be practical here. And he's going to come in, and he's going to comfort your mind. He's going to comfort your emotions. He's going to comfort your will. And he's going to draw you, and he's going to teach you how to eat real meat. You're going to wean yourself, like Psalm 31. I'm going to wean my soul from the things of this world, and I'm going to teach my soul to want to feast on the Spirit of God, that I'll be a spirit man, a kingdom person, letting God build me up in my faith. This is the foundation of where we go for the next two weeks. You have to know this to be able to win in the other areas that we're talking about. So I'm praying that today, God's giving you right now, we're going to take just a few moments. You're going, to, you're going to close your eyes and bow your heads, and God's going to give you something that you're going to, he's going to say, uh, yeah, this part of your soul, these choices, this area, you love it more than you love me. It controls you more than I have say over your life. And, and you're going to write that down, and, and what you do is then, each day, it may be your cross. Daily, you say, here it is, God. My dad, who became a program director of a 23-bed inpatient rehab center before he dies, this is what he was doing after being an alcoholic for most of his life, going from job to job, jail to jail, all the different things. Now he spends more than a dozen years of his life helping men and women understand all this. And he said, I've learned this, Kevin. That daily has to be more sometimes than just daily. He said, I've taught them if you can make it for another five minutes, just give it to them for five more minutes. And then give it to them for the next five minutes. And before you know it, you got past the day. And I thought, Dad, that's powerful. That's powerful. If all I have is is the ability to, to surrender my will to Jesus' will for five more minutes, I'll do it for five more minutes. Wow, what great breakthroughs started to come through when that knowledge came to me. My dad didn't realize it. He was growing in his spirit, man. As he was learning to be free from his addiction, he was learning how it was to walk in the spirit, moment by moment, step by step. So close your eyes and bow your heads. Take these few moments. Let God's spirit bring an area to your heart and mind. And I know because it's every believer's battle. There's going to be an area where he's going to say, this gets more than I get. This gets more than I get. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to speak to each of us. We will be quiet so you can speak.
I know you think this was very quick, but I know this. You knew before you even closed your eyes. You just had to say, yes, this is the area. If you've written it down, if you put it before the Lord, this may become your cross the daily, maybe even several times during the day. You have to say, Spirit of God, this is yours. This is yours. And declare, remember, this is resurrection power. Power that raises the dead will give you power in this area. And that which used to be that which people would say, they'll always be weak in that area, it'll become your greatest testimony. Did you hear that? It'll become your greatest testimony. In closing, we're going to stand. I'm going to ask if you'd like to, this is, this is part of the process, you surrender. This is what sanctifying is. It's, it's the most surrendered life. And so what you surrender today, you may have to surrender again this evening or tomorrow morning, but you learn to do it in God's house, the safest place. I challenge you to find a place in your home, in your office or wherever it's at, where you can get down and you go, I surrender this again. I surrender it. And so let's stand together and maybe some of you just want to come and just kneel here this morning and surrender what, we're not going to ask you what it is, but maybe you want to come and just surrender whatever it was and say, God, I'm starting the process. I'm surrendering it right here. And just come kneel. You, you, why kneel? It's, it's a humbling place that we come and kneel before him this morning. Amen? Amen. Praise God. How cool. Just imagine this many victories happening right here. Isn't that neat? Praise God. Hey, church, let's, 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 let's heaven's rejoicing right now because breakthroughs are happening. We, let's just praise him right now for a moment. Let's just praise him. All right. And whether you're there in your pew or down here, agree with this prayer right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for salvation, your spirit in us. We declare greater is you that is in us than he that is in the world. You're greater than our soul, greater than our mind, our emotions, and our will. So we surrender. We surrender right now to your spirit. And we invite you to come and fill our mind. Fill our emotions and fill our will with your presence. And each day may we learn to walk by your spirit in these areas. That you'd be able to commune with us and talk with us in this. And that we would see the transformation of who we are as husbands, as wives, as men and women of God. That we could become bold men and women knowing that we can win because the power of resurrection has set us free. And if you set us free, Jesus, we're free indeed. So we claim that right now in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Hey, God bless you. Hug one another.